uh, with Manifest Digital. Um, we're a user-centered design firm based in Chicago. Um, I also work with Mary Cousin at ShyTag. I'll let Brian speak a little bit more about ShyTag. But um, the Chicago Toy and Game Group is a global organization that advocates for inventors, um, for people that make toys. Um, we have a professional and public conference in Chicago in November. But Mary, um, many of you probably know her, has meetups um, throughout the world throughout the year. Um, so she is, runs a networking group as well. Um, I have three guests this, this morning on the panel. Um, we have had no time to prepare since these aren't the original um, panelists. So they'll be hearing some of these questions for the first time. So um, you'll get a truly off the cuff inside view. Um, we've got Carlos Dominguez from the iPlay group at Hasbro. Um, I'll let Carlos speak a little bit more about himself as they're getting mic'd here. I've got Brian Torney, um, who represents the Chicago Toy and Game Group, and he'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and Paul Berberian, am I pronouncing that correctly, from Orbotics, um, that make Sphero, which some of you may have seen down on the show floor in the game section. If you haven't, I encourage you to go check it out. It's a app-enhanced toy with augmented reality components. Um, so we're going to talk about being an inventor in the digital world. Um, I've got four or five questions here, and then I thought we could kind of open it up for some Q&A. Um, we'll wait a second until Paul gets mic'd here. Um, why don't we actually start out with you guys? Um, here, actually, well, stand here. Um, just talking a little bit about what you do and how um, digital has affected product development in your world. Um, yeah, so um, Ann and I uh, helped to co found a company uh, in 2004 called Noiji, which was uh, kind of a our attempt to create the, the early hybrid of a digital slash um, traditional play company. Um, we grew out the company and in 2012 we sold it to, um, to Manifest Digital and then we started a company called Other Door Entertainment. Um, Other Door is uh, a toy and game invention company but it's one that specializes in kind of the, the transmedia, um, the transmedia sphere. So this idea that there are multiple channels that we need to pursue for play. Um, so around the time that we started to form Kanoichi, we met up with Mary Cousin, who was the uh, impetus for this panel. And we really didn't know much about the inventor sphere at the time. Um, what we were doing was mostly work for hire stuff that um, Hasbro would call us up and say, hey, we need you to, uh, to create this thing, and we're going to pay you this amount of money. Uh, so we were very interested in the alternative uh, um, compensation of uh, an invention package which uh, allows for royalties and stuff like that um, and it also allows you a little bit more control over what it is that you're bringing out um, to the manufacturer so uh, th for us I think at that time and especially for me I think that there was a the digital really meant something um, because we looked around at the sphere of toy and game inventors and um, technology and digital technology was still a number of years behind um, you know, we were still seeing a ton of toys out there that, um, you know, were Hot Wheels and Matchbox cars and Tonka vehicles that, um, you know, were supposed to be kind of the height of toy technology, but they really just incorporated lights and sounds. Um, that had begun to change already, but we wanted to be part of that process of changing that up. Yeah, so, um, Carlos Dominguez, so I work at Hasbro with the Integrated Play Group. Uh, some of you may have may know us for the Furby product. Um, so for us, I mean, digital obviously has been a very big part of our DNA. Uh, we focus directly on the blend and the merge of the digital and the physical space. Uh, personally, obviously, I grew up in both spaces. Uh, for me, uh, you know, G.I. Joe was as important as my Atari. You know, and then as I grew up, you know, figuring out how to make that leap into how do you create this play that you're they're used to you have in front of you and they go into the screen and to the digital space and how do you create that space and start working on how do you make video games and how do you create that amazing experience and so I would say that you know even though I have over eight years of uh, professional 
game development experience, I have over 38 years of play experience, right? Because we all play at one point or another in our lives, and hopefully you're all playing still. So uh, the digital space is not to replace that physical space, but actually it's helped us enhance that physical play. And I'm sure we'll, we'll touch some points on that and how it's actually also helped us distribute that experience and be able to uh, reach a wider audience and a wider mass. Uh, that you would if you were just, say, a physical, especially if you're a starting uh, inventor or a small company who wants to reach out your, your audience or find out, even more important, what that audience might be for your product. Uh, I'm Paul Barbarian. I am uh, the CEO of Orbotics. We make a, a robotic uh, connected toy called Sphero. It's a robotic ball. It has uh, over 30 different apps on the, uh, for both Android and iOS. And I mean, we're all about digital, right? I mean, we started the company, we raised uh, a bunch of venture capital, and the whole focus is creating a play experience that um, isn't just turning the phone into a $2 remote control, mm. it's really creating a play experience that merges those two worlds, the digital and the, and the physical. Um, you know, we like to say, like, hey, you wouldn't use a phone from 1999, a uh, cell phone from 1999, why, why do we want kids to be using toys that look like they've been designed in 1999. Um, I think you know, kids are, are getting their devices at a much younger age. Um, and it's very important for, you, for us to figure out how to enhance that play experience, but not keep them solely focused in the digital world. They got to get off the couch. They got to yep. exercise. They got to chase things around the house. Um, and so we're building a series of robots that, that aren't just Putting controls in, into an RC, you know, into a car or to a boat. We're trying to create novel form factors. So we have a, a ball called Sphero, and we have a tube called Tubi um, that we just announced. And they're really fun, and, and they, there's a lot of feedback from the sensors coming to the device that allows you to create different types of gameplay. So as you mentioned, augmented reality is one of the, the components, but there's a lot of other a lot of other capabilities we can talk about with what the sensors will really enable you to do. And can you remind us all again where your booth is on the show floor so we can go check it out after the Sure. Panel? So um, you would look for a giant ball, <laughs> much larger than this, but um, you'd be able to come play with it. Uh, we're in the South Hall, mm -hmm. and as you, as you walk through the South Hall, you take the stairs down, and you'll see a, a, little, a little carnival out there, the atmosphere with a, a bunch of people driving robots. Cool, cool. Um, and we have a fourth panelist who just joined us. That's Andrew Gias, Gias from Hasbro. Um, Andrew works in a different department uh, than Carlos at Hasbro, so um, can you tell us a little bit about the group that you work with Hasbro and how you work with um, inventors and how digital figures into what you do at Hasbro? Sure. So our team is responsible for working with uh, a global community of professional toy and game inventors. Um, Hasbro, we have a wonderful design team and, and engineering team, but uh, no one can have all the ideas. No one can own all the ideas. So <clears throat> we've we work with a huge community, and the toy industry is unique in that it's historically been pretty reliant on invention for, uh, for some of our biggest hits. If you, if you go back in history, uh, Furby was an inventor item. Uh, most of our games portfolio came from inventors. Uh, so in, in a lot of our licenses, too, we have inventor items as well. So Tickle Me Elmo was an inventor item. So it's really important that we keep close contact with this, this community globally, uh, and our team works uh, to do that, as well as focusing on technology. So uh, in our group, there's three segments. We all look at everything, but there's specialists. So uh, there's someone that looks after toys, someone that looks after game, and I focus on technology. So my small team, uh, we focus on looking for cool technologies, maybe in adjacent industries that aren't affordable yet or don't have an application in toy. Uh, and we work to build partnerships uh, with those companies and those technology providers and to create compelling toy and game experiences. Um, so coming to shows like CES is really interesting. We see a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, maybe that's in a, you know, maybe we, we find inspiration from a hundred dollar, you know, remote control ball that we could never do at, at you know, in Hasbro's sort of constraints. But um, finding partners like Sphero, like Samsung, like Lenovo, like these, these folks that are doing really high-end stuff, maybe we can find a way to do something that's compelling for our, our toy and game audience uh, in that space. Great. Thanks. Um, so before we get started with some questions, I want to talk about how digital has affected uh, inventing in the product development, packaging, patenting, marketing, retailing, financing. Um, but I think it would be beneficial for um, 
our panel to know who you are and what audience they're speaking to. Um, at ChiTag, we're often talking to startup companies, standalone inventors, but we're at CES, and it's a pretty big audience. So quickly, from a show of hands, um, can, can you raise your hand if you're in the toy and game industry, if you're in the play space? Okay, it looks kind of 50-50, which is interesting, and I think that'll be good for our panelists to know. Um, play, as we all know, is um, it's a very competitive feature right now in any space you're in. I mean, if you're in healthcare and you're developing a caregiver app, if you can make it delightful and playful, it will be more successful than your competitors. So I think even though we'll be coming from a toy and game perspective, um, it's an industry that's germane to any industry. Um, also, from a show of hands, can we get... Um, how, how many of you, um, is a physical product kind of key to your business? All right, interesting. Again, kind of 50-50. Um, so again, as we're answering these questions, please think about people that are coming from a business perspective of um, an all digital product or an all digital, um, all physical product or all digital product and how that might, some of the technologies and new systems we'll be discussing kind of affect that. Um, so that said, our first question is, um, how does today's digital environment both help and hinder inventors or startup companies or um, maybe an ongoing business help their ability to finance and or market their inventions? Let's focus on financing first, actually. Um, I know Kickstarter probably comes to mind with a lot of people. Um, I know, um, obviously, we'd like to hear from you about how you, you've um, gotten your startup. I know from Hasbro, you partner with inventors. If you could talk a little bit about how um, platforms like Kickstarter and um, like how you communicate with inventors now and learn about new technologies and how that figures in. And um, Brian, in terms of outreach from an inventor perspective or um, you know, some advice that ShyTag might give inventors as well. Mm -hmm. So any, any takers? I'll start. Um, we're, so we're venture backed. Mm -hmm. We've raised um, uh, a lot of money. Uh, we've raised about $17 million so far to take our products to market. Um, you have to have a venture capitalist that believes in the revolution that's happening in toy, right? They, they, they have to understand where it's going and the opportunity that lays ahead of you. If you look at Kickstarter, it's great to get, kind of get through your prototype in your first minimal production run, um, but very quickly, uh, your capital needs will outstrip. I mean, if you have any level of success, um, very, very quickly, your capital needs will outstrip anything that you can do from a community-based um, you know, funding source, uh, especially as you try to establish uh, retail distribution and to establish your channel uh, as you expand internationally. So financing is, is critical. It's not easy. It's actually really hard. You know, if you look at venture capitalists, typically they like to invest in things that are going to you know, save the world or mm -hmm. You know, some new cloud-based, you know, software as a service um, type company that, you know, if they want to add another million customers, they buy more servers. Uh, so for us, if we want to make, add another million users, we got to make another million zeros. Um, and that costs real money. So there's a, there's a, there's a, people are shy about investing. So you have to, you, it's, you really have to look long and hard to find those right investors. That said, it's a lot cheaper to get to that minimal viable product, to get it out into the market, and to get some user feedback. And with the nature of having the mobile device, uh, you can get things out there and modify them in the field if things don't work. So we've probably done a, you know, 20 different software updates just on our main. Um, 20 new software updates. Uh, you know, to our product in the field, and it will totally change the play experience. I mean, we just did one before Christmas, and we increased play time by over six-fold. And that's another thing you get in this digital world, is you get real-time stats on what every single user is doing. At least in our case, we get it every 20 seconds. And do you feel that having that kind of evidence cycle sped up has helped you with your investment in, in talking to It is. I mean, you know, we're, we're always... Uh, this. The CEO's title is not chief executive officer, it's cash extraction officer. <laughs> right? You have to keep the cash in the bank to keep the business going forward. And our, um, these stats are, you know, I'm being pinged for stats almost on a daily or weekly basis from our investor group. Um, you know, so, so we are, you know, you know we, we monitor things like how many 
you know, like spheros have rolled from the Earth to the moon, right, on a cumulative basis, because I, I know how many centimeters every single sphero has rolled. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's critical. If you can't show those usage stats, you're, you're, it's hopeless in terms of raising capital. Yeah, I'll, I'll let, uh, you know, in the sense of Hasbro, I'll let uh, Andrew talk a little more about the specifics of financial and, you know, how the, uh, some of those pieces. Are. But from the design side, one thing I can tell you is that definitely on the digital space has helped out a lot, to your point, you know, um, be able to get that, you know, offering into the masses. Because if you're able to finance to give it to one person, because it's, you got digital distribution, then you can give it to a million people or whoever you can reach out through your, your digital distribution. And having the analytics, I mean, that is just key also because you get automatic feedback of what people are doing, how they're playing with your toy. You believe that you created this amazing experience, you did focus test, and it was just incredible. But then when they grab that offer, that experience, they take it at home with nobody watching, they might play completely different. And you might find out, oh wow, you know, this gameplay, which we thought, you know, this specific side of the game, we thought it was cool, but we were just like a, you know, a complement to the main basic mechanic. It's actually the most popular piece of the whole experience. So then what you can do is you can do updates that enhance that play and that add more value to that little piece so that your customer gets full feedback. And by that feedback, you can also see sometimes, and they can actually, you know, guide you what your next product would be or maybe what the next update, what the next offering of that specific lineup could be. So it's definitely changed, and, and it'll help, it helps a lot of people, to your point, to be able to reach out and also get that to market a little quicker, uh, but not to be uh, confused with the fact that, oh, digital is just easy, a lot easier than physical. You know? They're both challenging in their own way, and especially when you deal about creating physical and digital experiences, as you know, then that adds a whole another layer of complexity on it. Okay, so yes, definitely helps us get more investment and helps us to invest our own funding in the product more wisely right. with that mm -hmm. real-time feedback. Exactly. Andrew, do you have anything you want to add to that? I get the boring part. <laughs> uh, digital is, is interesting. It's a bit of a double-edged sword. I think there's an expectation now that everything is going to be app-enabled or have a digital component. Um, so kind of like five to ten years ago when everybody expected a website for a product. Uh, so it's 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 tempting to since our our clock speed is so high we're we're in a, an industry where every year there has to be new news and a whole new line refresh and and big key drivers uh, it's it's difficult to really dig in and create a compelling app experience we're we're, we're selling products more than we're selling platforms Sphero is awesome because they have a, a, a an excellent product message and they can continue to evolve the Sphero platform whereas you know, every year we have to market a different, you know, a different Elmo, a different Sesame line. Um, so it, it's a little bit challenging to create compelling digital experiences for every, you know, toy line that we do. And, and Carlos's team does an amazing job at that. From an inventor standpoint, uh, digital is, is amazing because it lowers the barrier to entry dramatically. Uh, if you're pure digital, you're, you, the, the considerations that you have in terms of manufacturing and, and supply chain and all that retail stuff that you have to deal with goes away. And that's, that's just amazing. Um, but for inventors that come to Hasbro, we're, we're a branded play company, not, not a toy and game company anymore. We, we underwent this transition a few years back. So we're all about our, our brands. So an inventor will come to us, and even if the product idea is brand specific, um, Carlos and his team are going to go out and create an amazing digital experience, you know, alone or in partnership with that inventor. So having something that's buttoned up isn't necessarily a requirement. Um, but having a, a digital embodiment of what that vision could be, maybe it's a demo or a flash demo or boards or, you know, something working, I think, you know, is, is super helpful. Great. And Brian, can you provide us a little bit of an inventor perspective? I think traditionally in the inventor world, there's this business model of behind closed doors, we'll invent the next Furby or Tickle Me Elmo and kind of not let any of the public in and then spend a lot of money going directly to an investor or a big company and saying, you know, buy my product. And I think we're seeing more and more in the toy and game space companies like robotics that also go kind of directly to the public. Obviously, they're kind of riding the edge of the line between investor and going to the public and um, being more iterative and agile and um, ag again with like Kickstarter we're seeing some companies go directly to the public first and then get investment later. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that space is changing and, and what is changing that? Yeah, I think it's, I, I don't think it's ever been harder for a traditional toy inventor to, um, to sell through a product to a, a manufacturer. I also think it's probably the most exciting time. Um, 
you know, I, I think that when you talk to a lot of the guys who've been doing it a lot longer than, than like Anna and I have, um, you know, you, you find out that, uh, you know, in, in yesteryear, it used to be, it used to be okay to think about a product and think about just that experience of what they're doing. And today, it's, it's really different. Um, you have to think about the fact that kids are consuming media at such a, a massive degree that they're consuming it concurrently. That, you know, I would say, arguably, it's almost unlikely that at any given time, someone's playing with a toy that you create without engaging with some piece of media at the exact same time. Because statistically, you were talking about, for certain age groups, about 12 hours of media consumption during a six-hour period. So that really changes things about how you, how you develop things. It, it says you have to understand digital. If you don't understand digital, then you're missing a key component. Even if your product has nothing to do with digital, you have to understand what's going on because that kid is interacting with digital devices at the exact same time as he or she is playing. Um, it's something that, uh, in terms of the Chicago Toy and Game Group, we've really found as a great challenge uh, to impart on the next generation of inventors. For the, the half the audience here that um, are, are not in the toy and game invention sphere, what I would assume is that you're very interested in getting into it with the particular backgrounds that you have. And since a lot of those same people are coming from a digital direction, that couldn't be more exciting. Uh, because it means that you understand play from a different perspective than some of the traditional inventors do. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the, the event itself at Shytag, what, what Chicago Toy and Game Week is all about is in November, it's a gathering of people who have this tremendous amount of experience uh, with, uh, with toys and games, with digital, with marketing, with every aspect of the industry, uh, with a focus on uh, getting your inventions out there. And so for those few days of the year, uh, kind of this kind of an eclipse of the moon, and suddenly the big guys like Hasbro will take meetings with people that have no background in this industry and haven't been doing it for 20 years, like your uh, Big Monster Toys or your Ray Kempers and stuff like that. So suddenly um, the doors open and you get to come in there. And um, as, as Andrew and Carlos both said, the barrier of entry is so much lower. Um, you can create a, a digital demo for something for an app enhanced product and, uh, and show this thing off without the same amount of investment that it might take to create this massive uh, product launch. So it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how this stuff transforms in the next few years. Um, it's also going to be interesting to see how um, the kind of current slate of products that are taking uh, digital in as, as kind of part of the perspective, how those products behave in the marketplace. Because we're already seeing some audience fatigue from the buyers. Um, and I think from the end user, we're seeing uh, that perhaps the industry hasn't necessarily gotten in the right direction yet. Um, for instance, uh, Furby. Furby is one of the, the best examples of products that have actually come out there that has an app-enhanced component. Um, and that's because uh, you know, these guys decided that they were going to take a look at this product and decide, all right, so what does it mean physically? What does it mean digitally? And the product offers this amazing experience, even if you're not using the digital device. So it's only additive when you throw that into the mix. So it's that kind of right cocktail balance of, of you know, what is, what's the right amount of physical for this product? What's the right amount of digital for this product? And most of the products that have come out there so far in that sphere just haven't done that. Um, they haven't taken a look and made sure that it is an awesome product from the physical side and an awesome product from the digital side and combined those in a way that was satisfying for the audience. So as people are kind of going through, um, and it's probably the biggest question that we get during Chicago Toy and Game Week is, you know, how much do you need to think about this while it's going on? Um, it's, you know, it's a great thing to think about, and I don't think any of us have a perfect answer for it of, um, you know, what's the right mixture? Because it's going to be based on whatever specific product is in your head at that time. And I wanted to add one more thing that I think it's important also for the physical folks as well that don't have the product is that, that now a lot of people, almost everybody, has access to video editing, software compositing tools that were not available to everybody in the past. And so even if you're just doing a physical presentation to a group like us, right, um, visuals, right? A picture tells a, a thousand words, right? Video tells a million words. So anybody can just grab their phone, 
take a quick video, you know, have access or have a friend that knows After Effects, does a compositing of what the final vision is, and then now you're presenting a quick video, you know, teaser of what your product is. That's something that is very important also that digital has completely changed that we didn't have access to, I mean, a few years ago. Yeah, that's actually one of the biggest changes that we've seen is uh, two years ago, Andrew's team was, you guys were accepting huge amounts of physical uh, prototypes and stuff like that. And uh, over the last couple of years, it's been like, a, oh, come on, don't send us those giant things. Send us a, like a 15 second video, it'll be cool. Mm -hmm. Which is a really cool shift uh, from the inventor side, because again, it lowers the barrier of entry. I, I recently had an inventor ask me for the first time, uh, instead of sending in a, a model, can I send you a, a 3D file and you can print it you know, in house? That's awesome. And I was just floored. I didn't even know what to say. We have huge 3D printing capabilities, but it was, you know, and then he brought it in, he showed me the thing, and he had some ideas, and a few weeks later, and he said, can I send you a file? I have some updates to my yeah. submission. I was like, wow. That was cool. So. Yeah, I, I think we're, what's interesting is we, um, when we started the company, we didn't think we were a toy company, right? We, we thought we were a play company, and, and I still think we're a play company. We're at CES, and we're not at Toy Fair in Hong Kong right now. Um, and I think, uh, I think what's, What's interesting is, is par um, when I was young, the parents would say, kids, go play, right? They'd send you off, and then they'd have grown-up time. And then you would sneak around and try to listen to what the grown-ups were talking about. <laughs> um, now it's, kids, let's go play, right? Parents are really much more engaged with their kids in the play experience. And so when we build our product, we're not building for an age demographic. I mean, there's a you know, the parents will, we call, we're, we're building towards what we call the tech forward families, families that are into, you know, have multiple tablets and iPhones. And I think, I think as you look at your, I, I bet, I don't, I don't know, but I suspect that the Furby demographics are all over the map. You know, you have, they're in offices and they're in little girls' rooms and they're, you know, boys are battling them and, you know, the play experience has changed so much that it's no longer about, okay, this is for eight, eight to, nine-year-old boys, right? And I think that's important, and I think you really see that with digital, because the digital can, and the digital can change the experience for what the child or the adult is looking for, so that it's no longer specifically designed for one purpose. It's a multi-purpose device. And if, and if that happens, you get to expand your market, you get to invest more in the technology inside the physical product, so you can build better, better toys, you can build better play experiences. And and I think that's, what, that's, that's another key element of digital. You don't have to focus on one demographic because digitally you can modify the experience completely for what's happening. Like our developers built this fun game, kind of like Hot Potato. They built it because it's a great drinking game, which is obviously a very adult game. Uh, but the kids love it too. Um, but they just don't know why they built it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It's actually a great segue into the next topic I want to cover, which is patents and intellectual property. Now, Arbotics has an open source software component to it. Um, I'd like to hear about that and how that's um, you know, affected your business model, if at all, and how bringing fans into you know, being allowed to develop some part of your product has um, you know, affected your product itself. And, and also, I'm interested, I think the audience would be interested to hear at what point in the process um, you looked into patenting, which is traditionally a very important um, component of the inventor profession. Um, and then for, for the rest of the panel, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about how digital communication mediums let you get your product out there very easily. Um, I know that some inventor relations people at larger manufacturers avoid crowdsource platforms and they don't want to see stuff because they don't know at what stage it is in the patent process. And I know there's some liability issues there. And we are seeing more and more products on the market like Orbotics where it's co-created along with the business. Fans are having um, you know, a larger hand in the product. We can have um, maybe a product that works for five-year-olds, but it's also a drinking game. And I know for a bigger company, that can be a scary thing. So um, we don't promote that, by the way. <laughs> 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 um, so, Paul, do you want to start off? Sure. Talking a so, little bit I mean, about I think you have to do, you have to really uh, separate. It. I mean, patents are important for us as well. There's a mm -hmm. lot of um, technology that we've you know, developed, you know, our whole navigation system, our inertial measurement unit. I mean, we've put a lot of effort into the core technology. So we have, you know, you know 17 plus patents, you know, filed and one that's been awarded already. And it takes a long time to get a patent. It's very so expensive too. It is. Uh, and, and, 
and there's a lot of issues around patents. We don't want to turn this into a patent discussion, but the, the pace of innovation inside play um, is, is moving so rapidly. By the time you get your patent, you're really onto your third generation product. Uh, so it's, I think it's good to lay a foundation to start protecting your, um, your turf a little bit in terms of your core IP. But what we've done is we've opened up our, uh, we've, we've created this SDK um, for software developers to write their own apps to change the physical and virtual play experience for whatever they want. Um, so we support, I think, 14 different development environments uh, all the way, you know, we support some development environments that an eight-year-old child can write and make the robot do autonomous stuff, and we use it in education and classrooms and stuff like that. And then we uh, go all the way up to every everything that, you know, is, is viable we support. Um, and what we, what we encourage people to do is to write apps, which is different than um, crowdsourcing the hardware, right? Because that's where, that's where there's a lot of protected intellectual property. And then we, and then of course the firmware that sits on top of that hardware, mm -hmm. and that's protected as well. And then the SDK is exposed to give them controlled access into it, but then, but it's wide open in terms of what they can do. And we've seen a bunch of third-party apps developed. The problem, the, the, the good news is, is there's a lot of hackers out there and people that love to create fun stuff, but since it's not their full-time job and they can't make, you know, twenty million dollars writing apps for Sphero just yet because there's not you know, 100 million of them in the world. Um, you tend to get these demonstrations of technology, but not something that's truly viable, you know, from a, a business standpoint. So it's not like an Xbox or a PlayStation where someone can build a business around it yet. Yeah, I was just okay? going to say, how do you protect against that as yeah. the business grows? Yeah, so what, we encourage that, and we get, we get some apps out there, but we've created this process where we um, do a curation of it. So they will submit an app to us. We make sure, like, okay, this isn't going to, you know, someone's not going to download this and break their ball. And then we, um, we curate it. But it is a, it puts you into a different category. There's not a lot of things that you can kind of get that level of access. Mm -hmm. And so I think it just opens up the market to those innovators that want to experience controlling and writing software for something that's physical that moves around in their house. Um, and that's just a neat position to have in the marketplace. And I mm -hmm. think it's, I think, it's the way to go. So all of our products use that same SDK, or all of our current and future products will. So we built that whole IP around that, and now it's completely exposed to the world. Very cool. So when you guys are looking at potential partners or technologies, and you see that it does have an open software component to it, is that an incentive? Is it something that makes you pause? What do you look for when you're evaluating that? Specifically, it hasn't actually come up very directly yet, the open source submission part. Um, as far as patents go, patents are by no means uh, a requirement or a filing. It, if you come to Hasbro with an idea for a product, there's no patent requirement. Uh, and sometimes we'll see a submission, you know, here's my patent or here's my patent application. That's not an invention to me. That's, you know, you're protecting something about what you created, but I want to see what the invention is. Um, patents for the toy industry are more defensive and offensive, I would say. And people aren't out there, you know, we're not out there suing Mattel over what they did on, on a product. Um, but it really, for, for technologies and platforms, I think it's more important. Uh, the fundamental problem, though, is that our industry moves so quickly. We're working on 2015, 2016 now. Um, but if we file for a patent today, it's not going to be issued in time for our product to be introduced. And it might not be issued by the time the product is discontinued. So. Um, it's, it's, it's a real issue for us. Um, but in a sense, it's not an issue because, you know, like I said, filing for patent or having patent protection isn't super important. The crowdsourcing thing is, is really interesting. Um, the toy and game industry, we tend to like to own things. We want to see an invention and we want to, you know, we want to option that, we want to, we want to license it, we want to keep it from other folks. Uh, once it goes online, it's, it's out there. And, you know, you take a little bit of a risk by putting your, your stuff on Kickstarter, but um, for those that have worked with venture capital, you, you need to be comfortable with the fact that when you have an invention, uh, and especially in the digital space, you need to go out there and you need to, to be um, an evangelist for that. You need to promote that. You need to, to look at that uh, lack of privacy as an opportunity to get feedback and to grow and, and, and uh, evolve your platform. Um, for our space, um, it's interesting. It can be looked at as an opportunity to launch products that we couldn't do at retail. 
Uh, we haven't done it yet, but there are folks that are, are large companies that are doing things where they're, they're doing small runs of things or specialty things, and they're going right to Kickstarter. They're going right to the consumer, uh, which is interesting. For toys and games, you know, I don't think that if you put something on Kickstarter, it precludes you from, it would preclude us from, from coming in and licensing that from you or working together. Uh, we look at Kickstarter, Indiegogo, all those sort of platforms somewhat frequently, and we look for cool stuff. And, and uh, you know, I think it's, you need to know what you're getting into when you do crowdsourcing. You know, you need to really understand that there's a, a, a system to be game, just like there is when you work with large manufacturers. There's a lot of emphasis on, on your video. There's a lot of emphasis on you know, the background that you did before you got there. There's a way to win on Kickstarter. And it's not just to have a winning product. You can, you can get funded and, and not necessarily have such a great product. You can have a great product and not get funded. But to really do both is, is, not, is not easy. Also, the, the other piece to, to add to that is that um, you know, we, going back to you know, the open source and everything, um, obviously, as Hasbro, we don't want people to create a drinking game out of Furby, obviously, because we take very seriously the protection of our kids, and our, which is our core audience, right? So for us, I don't think it's, it's a matter of as much of somebody grabbing and you know, uh, stealing the code and, and breaking Furby, which is already known. Um, but um, it, it's more the fact that they could grab that and use it for, for evil purposes. You know, Somebody could grab it, and, and we've seen that. I mean, we've seen... Um, it, you know, Furby apps pop out that are not our Furby apps that claim to be Furby apps. That, so they're trying to trick the audience to say, oh, no, no, that's the official Furby app. And we go through them and we try to, to, to go through the stores and, and whatever we can. And we, we hear something, we look at it, and, and we're not out there to, to chase down and sue people and get their money. We're just literally, uh, honestly, looking out to see what's this doing? Is this affecting our audience in the sense of that, um, you know, they're going to get the wrong impression. They're going to download this app, think, oh, this is the way to go. And then, you know, they're getting advertised to buy stuff or to get money out of them. That's our biggest thing. And we've seen it. We, we saw a couple of cases where, where we looked at it and we evaluated it and we saw that it was not a risk for, for the target audience, mm -hmm. that this was not targeting the kids in any way. It was actually just finding ways to break the Furby play. And we thought, you know what, maybe it makes sense in this case. Uh, so we, we will not pursue it. And we, we saw other cases where it was, uh, to our point of view, it wasn't as, it was a little evil, you know, if you will, a little malicious. And so we, we asked, you know, we worked with legal to, to ask to, to remove that from the digital distribution. So I think to me, to your point, it's very exciting yeah. because also you can get feedback. Just like when we look at other uh, industries for inspiration of what we do, our audience sometimes can give us uh, amazing feedback of what we could do with, with uh, our product like you guys would, coming to us with an innovation. Do you have time for some questions? I believe so. I think we have till 9.45. OK. Um, I have a microphone here, and so we can, um, mm -hmm. if, are, are, is this a good time? Sure, it's a great stop. OK, here. I'd like to first thank Anna for um, stepping in at the last minute, um, not getting stranded in an airport. <laughs> and doing a fantastic job moderating. Thank you very much for uh, running a smooth panel. So, and I have this microphone here. Let's turn it over to you guys and ask any question that, that you'd like. Just raise your hand. Yes, Beth. Hi, everybody. Beth Marcus, uh, Playrific. Uh, somebody said, I'm sorry, I don't remember who, that um, maybe it was one of the Hasbro guys. Um, brands feel like having apps or digital is a must-have today. What do you think that's going to do in the next couple of years to what goes on in the marketplace if there's a checkbox that brands who don't necessarily understand kids on digital are going to have to fulfill uh, going forward? So, so, well, I don't think an app is a must-have. I mean, I think that... Um, there's a big expectation. A lot of people want to have an app, and, and, and we do. I mean, sometimes we, we sit down with brands, and they think, you know, we, they have a great product, and they're like, you know, well, uh, we need an app. And sometimes we'll sit with them and say, like, okay, let's sit down and figure out what the experience is. And then at the end of the day, we might decide, you know, if you look at the experience, an app is really not necessary for your product. Your product has a great experience as its own, just purely physical. So. I think that if somebody's trying to kind of go through the checkbox and say, you know, oh, uh, I got my marketing plan, check. I got my app, check. 
I think it's definitely the wrong approach, especially if you're trying to deliver a compelling experience. And you said it, I mean, very truly. And we've made mistakes on this sense where we've gone, here's a great experience, now slap on the app. That doesn't work, you know? And, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, examples out there on the shelves of products that I will not mention, you know, that, uh, and I'll turn responsibility, we, we did some of those as well, where we're not successful. Why? Because it was literally just, hey, slap an app. And I think that the key success there is you look at the experience as an experience, and then you figure out what is the best medium to deliver that. You know, is it physical? Is it digital? Is it a pure digital experience that has this companion physical piece? Is it a physical experience that has a companion app? Or in the case of when we did Furby, we decided this feels like it could be a 60-40 experience. So know? don't do a slap app. Definitely don't do a slap I app. I believe we have a new term that's been coined here oh, at wow. Kids at Play. Thank you. And, that in, and also CEO stands for? Cash, cash extracting cash officer. Extracting that, officer. That, that moved me yeah. in, in a very special way. <laughs> Thank you. A any I'll other questions? <laughs> I'll take you three years. <laughs> yes. Exactly. All right, so I come from the library sector. I talked to Sphero a couple of times. I don't know if you recall me. I'm um, Brian from the Evolve Project. Essentially, have you guys, uh, Brian specifically or Andrew, have you considered using libraries as a ground to do market research, research or product development testing? Using a library as a hub with the inflow of patrons and having the librarians teach the people how to use the product to get that product information and then relay it back to the inventor, to the developer. Libraries and schools are a big part of uh, what a lot of companies do. I think John's uh, company works quite a bit with, uh, with schools um, and with education. Um, and you know, I think on the inventor side of the table, the great thing about, um, about just using community type resources and stuff like that is that a lot of times I don't need to pay for some massive amount of market research. Um, what I need is I need people to play with the thing. I need people to take their hands and put them on the toy um, and tell me whether they're gonna have fun or not um, so that I can tell these guys and try and make a good case for the fact that this actually is fun. I swear this thing is actually fun. Um, and so anything like that that is, uh, um, you know, th that's possible in the community. I have not actually done something like that yet um, with a library, but I th actually I think that that's a pretty phenomenal idea because, um, it, you know, it, in terms of what a lot of companies are looking for, they're always looking for better educational products. And what better place to do that than with, um, with educators and, uh, and, and people that are, are there to help um, kids learn more, um, like libraries. Yeah, for us, um I don't know that anyone at Hasbro has thought of that. I certainly have it. It's an interesting idea. Uh, we do a lot of testing. You know, we think that one of the ways that we can win is to know our consumers better than anyone else. Um, some of that testing is in-house, where we have the people that are actually working on the product, observing, you know, what uh, how, or a prototype, how they're playing with it, which is super helpful because then you can go back, make changes, do it again, and, and evolve before you get to the point where you have to commit to a tooled experience. Um, but uh, that's, that's certainly pretty interesting. I'll have to think about that. Yeah, we, I mean, we do a lot of that, and I'm involved in a lot of that, and that's a great idea. I mean, I, I do it just independently, uh, where you know, I take my kids to the library. They go to the, I love going to the library, so I'll sit there, and I'll see how they play with toys outside their house, and I'll see how other kids are reading and playing with the toys and things like that and the different things they're doing. So I definitely think for an inventor, having that access is great, because now you have a huge access to this great focus group Work out with your local library, you know, and say, "Hey, do you mind doing this?" You know, simple, a few steps, a few questions, and then see what happens. I think it's a great idea. We definitely. We ended up buying one Sphero ball for the kids to play with. We ended up buying one Sphero ball, for instance, for the kids to Ooh, play with. It became that? so successful that we had kids asking if there's a sign-up sheet for it. So we That's had great. to buy ten essentially, and they still haven't really stayed on the shelves at that library, which is, which is really, really cool. Awesome. Thank you for your support. Catalog, well, that was a, a paid advertisement. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to ask one last question. And Anna, if you could go down the panel and just tell everybody two things. Biggest obstacle you've had and most best opportunity you see in the future. One sentence each to wind up our panel. Everybody, <laughs> biggest obstacle, best opportunity. Um, the biggest obstacle to being an inventor in the digital world um, I think is communication. Um, it's a lot of the issues we've talked about that have um, come up. It's 
translating your product, getting it to the right people, getting in front of the right investors, and doing it in the, the right ways. Um, I think communication is probably also the biggest opportunity. Um, we had a question where digital is, I think, kind of looked at as a, a checkbox. And I think I'd, I would just add to that what Carla said was fantastic. But um, it's not so much picking the right medium as the consumer expectations around those mediums. And that's really where we need to look, because the platforms and the mediums are going to be changing faster than um, we can keep up with our business. But I think it's important to know that people are different, that kids are different, um, that how they communicate is different, that it's um, their self-consciousness is different um, because of the way we communicate, because of these digital platforms that they've grown up communicating on. I think that's what we need to, to look to to develop the best products. And then I think communicating that challenge to the people that you know, are investing in our products, that's, that's the biggest challenge. But I think following that and making sure that we don't lose that focus on developing products that um, really fit our consumers, that's the biggest opportunity. Sorry, kind of took a roundabout way to get there. Um. So I'll say my uh, biggest challenge is um, cash. Uh, it's you know the it's easy to get going and it's hard to keep growing. You know we just you're constantly in need of expanding. Um, the opportunity side is there's it's such it's such wide open territory. I mean it takes you a while to get into the zone to really think how to blend the two worlds together the real and the and the digital but once you kind of figure it out like when we first started saying well it's a ball what the hell can you do with a ball um, you can kick it you can roll it okay next but then we started playing with it and doing our own R&D on our own product and it the ideas just exploded and then it created so many more new product ideas that you know, once you get into that zone, once you really start embracing how the two come together and you think about it as a collective experience, not as an app that gets slapped onto something, it's transformative. Mm -hmm. It's transformative, the opportunity out there. And there's no shortage of ideas. I think uh, uh, for me on the design side and innovation side, I would say the biggest challenge is education. Uh, so it's actually, um, Educating and evangelizing, if you will, you know the idea that technology is not a crutch, but is actually going to help you. Uh, and it's this digital space is, can be really helpful, but also educating uh, about the digital space, the fragmentations and the things. And just because there's a headline that says something doesn't mean that we have to run after it. You know, it just means okay, it's there. You know, and that becomes also the greatest opportunity. It's out there. Technology is out there. We live in a in a time where it's amazing, and I've talked to some people here, I've seen some of the panels, and, and one thing I've taken out is there's so much technology out there for all the different things that you guys want to do and that we all want to do that you know, it helps you try to really focus on that experience. I mean, I'll keep saying it. It helps you focus on that experience so that you can then, once you come up with the experience, there's a technology out there that will help you get it there. And if there, there isn't, guess what? In six months, there will be. I think the, the biggest challenge uh, for the independent inventor is quantity. Uh, it goes right along with, uh, with money, because you need money to build up the quantity. Uh, if you're an inventor, you have to go out there with a lot of ideas. Um, the story I always tell is the, the story of Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, who created Superman. They really created that one thing, and they sold it for 100 bucks. And you don't really want to be them, because uh, you know, they, they ended up destitute. Uh, and it's one of those situations where if you, as an inventor, were to come in there with this holy idea and show it to Andrew and say, this is like this, is this amazing thing. I'm, this is the best thing on the entire planet. I got patented. It cost me a bunch of money to do that. I have this amazing presentation. And he goes, yeah, but I'm sorry. I got that already. Or, or oh, I'm sorry. That's, that's actually, we've, we've done things like that in the past. Then you, know, you, you haven't put in the effort necessary. Um, the, tied in with quantity is the idea that you have to be ready to go, yeah, this, this thing that I spent all this effort on, yeah, that's done. That's not, that's not happening. You have to move on to the next thing uh, and be prepared to have as many ideas as possible. It's something that has to happen. It's even more pivotal for the manufacturers in the room because if you don't have this quantity of innovation happening at the exact same time, then you're going to be caught unaware. It's the reason why Andrew and his team seem to be everywhere on the planet and we're going, oh, wow, you guys are back in Chicago this week? Wow, that's, you know, you guys were just there three months ago. And it's, it's because you have to always be looking for what that next thing is. 
and no idea can be holy enough that um, you think, yeah, this is, I'm just done, I'm good, I got this, I, I got this good. Um, and that's what the novice inventors end up, end up doing. So just, for me, quantity of ideas. Uh, yeah, I would, <clears throat> my, my, I would say something similar. Uh, the barrier to, being a to having a digital invention is low. The barrier to being an inventor is, is high because uh, inventors were failing fast before that was a word that you learned in business school. Um, you have to have a big volume of ideas. You, it's just, it, it's a numbers game at the end of the day. Uh, and the professional toy and game inventors that I know that have been out there for a long time, they'll come, like the really old school guys will come with the big case, they'll roll it in and they'll, they'll show you something and they, they pitch it and they want to know yes or no, a little bit of feedback and okay next and they pull out the next thing. Um, if you sit there and try and sugarcoat things and well, you know, this is really cool, but they just want to know so they can move on because it, really to be an inventor, it's a hard business and it really does depend a lot on volume. Uh, in terms of opportunities, um, for us, we had a, a huge platform that was, was big for us from a revenue standpoint this Christmas that came from an inventor. I think if, if you're lucky enough to, to hit things right, um, we have a huge reach in terms of distribution and, and audience and, and people that look at our brand. So uh, if you have that one in a million shot where you do get the right thing that fits with our our plans at the time in the right product year and has the technology and is marketable and can be communicated easily on shelf and can be a digital experience, you know, all those things, you know, it's, it's, it's great. So do you have anything, sir, do you have anything to add? You've been sitting here on this, uh, we're kind of going down to the, <laughs> actually, you young kids, are you ready to learn from someone who's seen it all? <laughs> yeah, I, I've been watching John, um, uh, kind of nod his head and So, um, so, so, but you could hear him, you could hear him. So, and it's been great, and it's a great transition. Um, and I'd like to thank you again for stepping in, and what a wonderful panel this was. If you could just thank these guys.